A few centuries ago, these fields rumbled with the sounds of wagon wheels, horse hooves, and marching feet. 300 men, women, and children trudged through the marsh on their way to building a new life free from religious persecution. Suddenly, a scout brought word that about 2,000 mounted knights were rapidly approaching from two directions. Had the numbers been equally matched, the attackers could have easily wiped out the mostly peasant farmers and settlers. With a seven to one ratio and almost no place to take cover, there would be no contest. The crusading army would strike a quick demoralizing blow to the religious minority, showing their beliefs were not to be tolerated. Near the village of Sudomirz, in what is now the Czech Republic, Jan Zizka, the pilgrim's military escort, dug in between these fish ponds and waited. Within four hours, the battle was over and the movement was anything but crushed. Zizka had established himself as the greatest general in the region and the word Sudomirz entered the Czech vocabulary as an expression for accomplishing the impossible. Then one Czech stood up from the ranks of the knights, a man most brave, one-eyed, named Zizka, by the grace of God. And he stood up grimly and took the field to fight. And Zizka marched through the land with his soldiers, conquering castles and towns. And many battles he fought with strong enemies, yet he never lost a battle. It was more than 70 years before Columbus landed in America that Zizka came to prominence outside this window in Prague. The future printing pioneer Gutenberg was a teenager in Mainz, Germany. In Florence, the Medici family was just coming to power and Joan of Arc seemed no different than any other six-year-old. But on that Sunday morning in July, few people realized or even cared that they were on the threshold of a new era. Led by a passionate young priest named Jan Zielewski, a crowd gathered in front of the town hall. Zielewski was a monk who came to Prague and became a very popular, very powerful, a very charismatic preacher. He not only inspired people, one could say he inflamed them. As time passed, the crowd grew in size and their shouts grew in volume. The counselors listened patiently from the windows all the while making sure the doors were securely locked. Constance, Germany, four years earlier. Organized religion was in crisis. Nearly everything from religious services to the highest church office could be had for a price. Although barred from marriage, allegations of rampant sex among the clergy abounded. Most severely, a dispute over papal succession had led to the unique situation of three separate pontiffs within one Catholic church. At Bethlehem Chapel in Prague, Jan Hus, a noted scholar and rector of the university, was among the priests seeking reform. He preached in the local language rather than Latin, called for an end to financial improprieties, insisted that the Bible, not any of the popes, was the ultimate religious authority, and called for a higher moral standard for priests and monks. Sigismund, head of the Holy Roman Empire, also wishing to end the crisis, convened a church council at Constance, Germany. But Hus and Sigismund had very different opinions about reform. The emperor issued a safe conduct for Hus to come and present his viewpoints before the council. When the council concluded there was only one pope in place of three, and only ashes in place of Hus. The nobility, who were the leading political element and military element in Bohemia at that time, wrote a very angry letter to the Council of Constance, which was a precedent-setting kind of letter because here the nobility said, as laymen, we know something about religion that you as theologians don't know, and that is that Hus was a good Christian man and you burned him. The followers of Hus, now known as Husites, banded together in defiance of the church and the council. Their congregations became the first major denomination of the Reformation more than a century before Martin Luther. The official church imposed upon Prague an interdict. In medieval history, an interdict is simply the suspension of all religious activities in that particular location. No marrying, no burying, no baptizing of babies. 
no religious services at all. This had severe consequences for medieval people. To be cut off from the church was to be cut off from God. Sometimes persecution drives a faith underground, but sometimes it causes people to take to the streets. That is exactly where Zalewski and a huge crowd gathered that Sunday morning. In the windows above them was an anti-Hussite council, recently appointed with the instructions to suppress the rapidly growing religious movement. The council refused to yield to the angry mob, but after repeated bashing, the doors proved less resilient. They stormed into the tower, and they threw these councillors out the windows, where they either were killed by the fall or were put to the edge of the sword on the street below. After four years of simmering, revolution exploded. Zizka, probably there as merely another rebel, took control of the crowd, organized the defense of the newly conquered town hall, and with Zalewski, installed a new town council. Jan Zizka was a small landowner from the very bottom tier of nobility. He was born on this estate about halfway between Prague and Vienna, sometime around 1360. Family names were uncommon at this time, so he was known simply as Jan of Trotsnov, his hometown, or following a childhood injury, Jan Zizka, which may have meant one eye. Over his career, he worked as a soldier, a hunting guide, and a mercenary sent to terrorize enemies of the king. This carving from about 70 years after his death is the closest we have to a contemporary portrait. Václav, the king of Bohemia, had appointed the Hardline Council, hoping it would soften the Catholic Empire's position toward his largely Hussite domain. When informed of the slaughter, he screamed, ranted, bellowed, and went into an apoplectic fit. Two weeks later, he was dead from a massive stroke. Under the law of the times, the only person with a legal claim to the throne and to direct control of the realm was Václav's half-brother, Sigismund. The same Sigismund who had betrayed Jan Hus at Constance just four years earlier. The Emperor Sigismund was perceived by Hussites as the antithesis of everything that the Hussite movement stood for. He's the bad guy. They saw Sigismund as the primary enemy of Hus. Hus died because of Sigismund's treachery. Bohemia was an independent kingdom with about two million people in an area the size of South Carolina. The population was mainly Czech, ethnically and linguistically similar to Polish and Russian, but there was also a sizable German-speaking minority. And although it was a monarchy, the powers of the king were often not as influential as individual lords and barons. About a third of the land, including several large cities, were property of the church, which, like the nobility, seemed to be in a constant power struggle with the crown. Technically, Bohemia was part of the larger Holy Roman Empire, although the emperor had little real power and no one paid much attention. As often happens in revolutionary times, there was a breakdown in authority, which translates to a breaking of windows. Buildings, churches, and monasteries were burned. Religious dissension broke along ethnic and linguistic lines, with the Czechs favoring Hus and Germans often remaining loyal to the Pope and Emperor. Violence was everywhere, but it became most severe in Kutna Hora, about 40 miles from Prague. Control of the city was vitally important because of its wealthy silver mines. But although deep within Czech territory, it was populated overwhelmingly by Germans. <laughs> The miners of Kutna Hora, Germans, hunted for the Hussites and threw them into the empty mines even before the war had started. Monetary reward was offered for every Hussite captured. At the beginning, the Catholic side, which appeared to be much stronger, thought it would be able to deal with the Hussites with this kind of warfare. The king was denied his throne. The church was openly challenged just a year after the council at Constance ended. Terror and persecution seemed to be having no effect. To Sigismund and the Pope, there was only one solution. A crusade is the nearest Christian equivalent to the Muslim notion of a jihad or holy war, a war which is conducted against one's religious enemies for purely, allegedly purely, religious reasons. We're going to improve their theology. We're going to hit them over the head until they believe as we believe. This fosters the most gruesome kind of bloodthirsty warfare. <laughs> 
Thus one party fell out with the other, and whichever party held more power, that party killed and burned cruelly and without mercy, or took the lives of their enemies in manifold ways. And he whom God himself in his grace wanted to save, he alone remained alive. The Crusade's primary objective was Husa's home of Prague, one of the largest cities in Europe, and even then known for its stunning architectural beauty. Sigismund arrived with a vast army made up of soldiers from 33 separate nations. These forces were on a holy mission, but they had also been promised the loot of the city following their victory. To the people of Prague, it was an outrage. Sigismund was attempting to take the throne with an army of foreigners. Defense of the city fell to Zizka, who had few weapons or trained soldiers to withstand the approaching armies. The common people literally beat their plowshares into swords as they awaited the invading hordes. The crusading army didn't take the Hussites seriously. This was the first big battle, and they had a superior force. The emperor himself is there, and here comes Zizka, this old man, with some women, a ragged troops. There was a sense of incredulity. Who are these people? This is going to be a joke. This will be a rout. There were three main roads into Prague. Two of them went directly past castles still controlled by supporters of the emperor. The third passed beneath the hill at Witkow, just outside the city walls. Zizka realized if this hill were to be taken, the city would be starved into submission. He also realized he had about 15,000 citizens to stop 70,000 skilled mercenaries. A moat was dug beneath the closest castle, and two wooden forts were built atop Witkow. The attack began with a large army of mounted knights crossing the river north of the city and marching up the backside of Witkow Hill. The first fortifications gave way until all that remained was the wall and a wooden fortress occupied by 26 men, two women, and one girl. They're on top of this hill in this dilapidated fortress, and uh, the counsel of the men is, uh, let's sit tight here. Maybe they won't get here or something will happen. And one woman, though she was without armor, surpassed in spirit all men as she did not want to yield one step. Before Antichrist, so she said, no faithful Christian must ever retreat. And thus, fighting with supreme courage, she was killed and gave up her spirit. She gets killed, but her bravery or her action uh, inspired the others so that they did eventually uh, rout the, the, the much bigger force that was coming after them. The road along the top of the hill was then much narrower than it is today, and the small force was barely able to hold back the attackers, while the main Hussite force approached from the side, led by a priest and singing battle songs. Every bell within the city of Prague rang at once, and Zizka led a counterattack from the front. Somehow, a rumor spread through the Crusaders' ranks that these were not mere heretics, but that this was the army of hell. Each man tried to get in front of the other and running away. Many of those who could not resist the onrush of the fleeing men while trying to climb down the steep rock tumbled and broke their necks, and many were killed by their pursuers. The attack was beaten, but it could only be a temporary victory. Zizka knew that his enemies would be back and that he had little time to prepare. Zizka always understood that the odds against him were not good. His enemies were more experienced, better equipped, and far more numerous than any force he ever commanded. Zizka was not a simple man. He was a brilliant man in terms of military genius, strategic development, organization, discipline. He took simple people and he motivated them to do things that were way beyond anything I'm sure that they could imagine. One of the commander's first tasks was arming and training forces. It was a new concept because armies were typically made up of professional soldiers, but Zizka's supporters were mainly peasant farmers and craftsmen. You couldn't just hand a raw recruit a bow and say, here, go out and learn to use this. The, literally, the skeletal structure and the musculature necessary to do it would be impossible to cultivate without years of training. You simply have to start with the boy if you wish to have a man who is a competent archer. 
The hinged flail was something that Jan Zischka, as part of his military genius, adapted from peasant culture to military purposes. Every peasant knew how to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff by hitting it with what amounts to a club. Uh, a more efficient club is one that has a hinge in the middle because the transfer of energy from the human arm to the, to the striking end is ever so much more efficient if you do that. Well, if you want to hit someone instead of something, it makes sense to use the kind of instrument that you're used to using. Obviously, a flail was no match for a crossbow, but there was also no time needed for reloading. It could be used from any angle and soon proved to be an effective method for a foot soldier to attack a mounted knight. In medieval Europe, religion was in some way everything. Religion permeated society to a depth and extent that today we find hard to comprehend. The Hussite Wars were fought over many issues involving religious reform and the rights of individuals. But the right of communion came to be emblematic. In most Christian denominations, the taking of bread and wine representing the body and blood of Christ is a common ritual. But since the 12th century, Catholic priests had drunk the wine, but offered only the bread to laity. To the early Czech Reformation, the chalice was a link between heaven and earth, the sacral sphere. Participation on the sacral was mediated by the body and by the blood of Christ, that is, by communion. And only priests participated in communion. They saw in the Bible that the original or early disciples took both the bread and the wine at communion, and they said, why shouldn't every true believing Christian do that now, too? To Zizka and others, it was simple. Those who took both bread and wine with communion were faithful, and those who did not were heretics. Zizka took the field and marched through the land, and he burned the monasteries and drove the monks out of the country. And he ordered the burning of the priests who kept giving the communion to the common people in one kind only. Within the parameters of later medieval Europe and its forms of warfare, Zizka was pretty fair. This was a barbarous time of history. People were killed indiscriminately, sometimes in horrific ways, and Zizka was part of that context. Monks who were captured were routinely burned at the stake at Zizka's order. Cities and castles fell before the Hussite army in rapid succession. Vodnyane, Sobyaslav, Lomnice, Prakitice, Trebon, Kradets Kralove, and many others were conquered in an unbroken string of successes. Within 10 months, most of the country was securely in Hussite hands. The 15th century was, of course, part of the so-called Age of Chivalry. Women were often merely protected bystanders, but when captured, they burned just as quickly as anyone else. During the early years of the Hussite Revolution, everyone was fighting for survival. Women were an essential part of the armed forces, fighting alongside or sometimes in separate units from the men. Their method of fighting very often is commented on in that they were much more violent or much more ferocious is the word, perhaps a better word. Um, and, and here we have to understand the, the Hussite uh, approach to war, which is that they were being, they were facing annihilation. And many of them interpreted, especially the radicals, interpreted this threat as the Antichrist. And that they were the forces of Christ fighting the forces of the Antichrist. And in a war like that, you don't keep prisoners. And it was very often the women who said, uh, let's kill these prisoners. In any revolution, the rules change. And for a time, it appeared that the role of women would shift completely. In a few Hussite congregations, women preached and acted as priests. That, again, is a incredibly radical revolutionary act because here the women are entering that most holy of holy areas that men have just roped off for themselves. But the change did not last. In time the establishment prevailed and Hussite women returned to the same role as in other medieval cultures. What Zizka's army did change forever was the method and tools of warfare. Conventional battle tactics involve a frontal charge by squadrons of knights against an enemy's line, and it is extremely difficult to reinforce a line on the defensive 
so as to keep it from breaking under that kind of shock. Against the effectiveness of the armored knight, the castle was the best defense. But of course, castles are by nature immobile. This is a traditional cart from the times. Wagons such as this were used for farming, hauling, or just transportation. It was, in many ways, the 15th century equivalent of the pickup truck. But Zizka saw it as something more. The wagons were, very early on, redesigned for defense. They had protective shells and holes for shooting. Wagons were built to standardized dimensions so that they could be connected wheel to wheel, creating what was in effect a portable fortress. The wagons were grouped into a stair-step pattern and often surrounded by a trench, making attack on horseback particularly difficult. Even though it was a very, very complex maneuver, it seemed that Zizka practiced it very thoroughly, so they were very fast. In fact, these seemingly flimsy wooden wagons were probably more tightly and more densely defended than any castle of the day. So that the Germans were lured into a kind of psychological trap when they approached them, not realizing the density of gunfire and crossbow fire that they would come under. Each wagon had a standardized crew of 18 who worked together as a squad, each with specialized tasks and positions. Although mass production was virtually unheard of, parts were made to matching dimensions, and the wagons were uniformly outfitted. It was the beginning of military standardization. When the enemy began to retreat, Jiska gave orders to open the barrier of wagons and his troops attacked. This was, at the beginning, a very surprising element. There was simply no way that the Hussite troops could have maintained such a string of successes against more powerful enemies without an extraordinary sense of discipline. Part of this came from the force of Zizka's personality, part from the revolutionary fervor, and part from the organization itself. The Hussite soldiers liked to call themselves the warriors of God. It was a term that Zizka himself used. It is a song, the title of a song. It is really a self-description of the Hussite armies. They were the warriors of God, fighting God's fight against the powers of darkness and antichrist. Military songs were a central part of the Hussite army. Almost like chants, they permeated the culture and echoed throughout the countryside. These were not merely hymns in the usual sense of the word. They were kind of a manual of warfare. They were, in fact, a musical lesson on elementary military science. Those hymns are still common in the Hussite church. They are sung especially on festive occasions. As cities and towns fell before the Hussite army, it became apparent that the day of reckoning was approaching for Kutna Hora. By now, word had spread about the severity of Zizka's vengeance. But before he could arrive, Jan Zalewski reached the city at the head of a large force. Under Zalewski's orders, the entire population of the city marched out into one of these fields and with tears in their eyes, begged forgiveness for the atrocities committed there. The city and its inhabitants were spared on the promise that they would never again oppose the Hussites. And the revolutionaries gained control of one of the wealthiest silver mines in the world. It was customary for medieval generals to situate themselves on a high hill from which they could watch the progress of the battle and dispatch messengers with orders. But Zizka was never a customary general. In a battlefield situation, Zizka was in the center of the planning and in the execution of that plan. He was not an armchair general. Zizka was once again at the front of his forces as they stormed Rabi Castle. It was likely that there were ladders against these fortifications while siege guns hammered away at the other side. <laughs> 
The castle was taken quickly, but at a high price. One of the defending archers got off a very accurate shot, hitting Zhishka in the face. It was the kind of injury from which people didn't recover, particularly an old man in the hands of 15th century medicine. Zhishka was taken to Prague, where he hovered between life and death for two months. The Hussites were devastated. Sigismund was ecstatic. With the old general out of the way, he finally had the opportunity to destroy the heretics and retake his kingdom. With the help of Pippo Spano, a highly regarded Italian general, he devised plans for his second great crusade. German forces would attack from the west, taking cities and towns and occupying the Hussite forces. Then Sigismund and Spano would lead an army of Hungarian mercenaries from the east. With the crisis of leadership in the Hussite army, the defenders would be unable to divide their forces. It was not the first time Sigismund underestimated Zhishka. Carried thence to Prague and treated by physicians, he was cured of his wound so that he retained his life, but the light of his eye he never regained. Yet even so, he did not relinquish his labor as a conqueror of castles or his conduct of the affairs military. The blind people were well pleased to follow a blind leader. Future generations will be astonished by this story rather than believe it. Pope Pius II. The general recovered his strength, his passion, and his position, but not his sight. In a time 500 years before accessibility laws for the disabled, Zhishka resumed his work, seemingly unencumbered by his handicap. Zhishka měl kolem sebe velmi zdatné kolegy válečníky. Zhishka had very competent colleagues. Those people helped him. They, in fact, saw for him. They would describe the situation on the battlefield, and they would make decisions together. This implies that there was a very tight bond between Zhishka and his elite officers, as we would call them nowadays. Then, after some weeks, the German electors invaded the land with a very strong army, and with them were many princes, counts, bishops, and also the Margrave of Meissen, and they committed many cruelties. And whenever they got hold of a Czech, they killed or burned him every time. But the attack ended abruptly. Word reached the German camp that Zhishka, already thought by some to have supernatural powers, had somehow survived and was at that moment approaching. Here is Jan Zhizka, an old man, by medieval standards, a very old man, a blind man. He is withstanding them with a peasant army and being successful. Those crusaders perceived him as being some kind of demonically inspired individual. How else could this man possibly defeat superior forces? In short order, the entire force turned tail and fled. There was to be no two-front attack. By the early 15th century, Europeans had made a, an absolutely earth-shaking discovery. That is to say, you could make saltpeter out of rotting manure. Gunpowder is literally made out of animal manure, and there certainly was no shortage of that. The handgun, or pistale, from the Czech word for whistle, was little more than a barrel mounted on a stick. Once loaded and packed, it could be quickly moved to any location and fired within seconds. A smoldering length of rope pressed to the touch hole was the closest they came to a trigger. Yet this crude instrument was the first portable firearm and a vital tool for the Hussite forces. Zhishka immediately saw the advantage of such weapons. They required very little training, didn't call for the strength required to span a crossbow, and offered a tremendous psychological advantage. There were other types of firearms as well, including the mid-sized Tarasnitze and the larger Haufnitze, from which we get the word howitzer. Those weapons fired balls up to a pound or more in weight, and at short range they would literally blow a man apart. If you want a psychological effect, the effect of being spattered with the entrails of your comrade is, according to all soldiers who have had that experience, among the most unnerving uh, aspects of any battle. Zhishka ordered the guns mounted directly on the battle wagons. 
Now firearms could travel along with the army itself and be ready to fire almost as soon as the wagons were in position. Most of the firearms were on the side of the enemy, but what mattered was the tactical use of those weapons in defense. When attacking with horses, you can't use firearms, while the defenders could shoot at the attacking horses. And there is some evidence in the chronicles that Zhishka had ranks of loaders behind the actual gunners, uh, to whom those guns were passed for servicing so that he could maintain a rate of fire across the, shall we call them, the parapets of the wagons at a much faster rate than would otherwise be possible. Despite the failure of the Western invasion, Sigismund was still confident. Gradually, his Hungarian forces approached from the east, conquering towns one by one. Zizka knew immediately that one of their first destinations would be Kutna Hora, he arrived 12 days before Sigismund's forces and ordered major enhancements of the city's fortifications. The people of Kutna Hora worked side by side with the army to prepare for the inevitable attack. As they worked, they heard with growing horror tales of Sigismund's approaching forces. And his soldiers went around raping women and girls till they died. And everywhere the king ordered people to be burned. And this was a pattern of crusading mentality that we are on a crusade against the enemy, against the enemies of God, and none of these people are worth anything. And if they offer any resistance whatsoever, even passive resistance, we are more than obliged to kill them. The showdown between two of the greatest generals of the age began on a cold afternoon in late December. Pipo Spano with 30,000 highly equipped professional soldiers against Zizka with 12,000 revolutionaries and all the resources of the city. It was about the closest Zizka ever came to a fair fight. Zizka aligned his forces between two of the main roads leading into town. The artillery kept much of the attack at bay, but the sheer numbers of Spano's forces enabled him to surround the Hussites on three sides. Medieval armies did not fight after dark, and as the sun set, soldiers prepared to break for the night. This is when Spano took action. At a prearranged signal, agents inside the city opened the gates for his forces. The apologies and promises of a few months before were forgotten, and the citizens of Kutna Hora joined the bloody slaughter of all remaining Hussites in the city. Zizka and his army were now trapped between a hostile city and the emperor's army. In the morning, they would be bombarded and attacked from both sides. Those who survived the battle would almost certainly be executed. Sigismund personally remained near the lines so as to witness the historic defeat of the enemy so many had thought invincible. Then, just a few hours before dawn, Jan Zizka and his forces did the only thing they could to survive. They changed the rules. Cannons were highly inaccurate, slow to load, and difficult to operate. Their purpose was usually limited to knocking down walls. What Zizka did that night was turn his guns on the enemy line to create an opening through which his forces could escape. Today, the use of softening fire before a charge is a basic battlefield tactic. But at the time, it was revolutionary. There was one point which Zizka knew was particularly vulnerable, the camp of Emperor Sigismund. The firing began, and the Hungarian forces rushed to protect the emperor. Zizka's wagons broke their formation with incredible speed and burst through the confusion of the enemy line. Two weeks later, Zizka was back at Kutna Hora. The royal forces were unprepared and quickly defeated. It took only a few hours, but that was long enough for the mercenaries to gather all the wealth they could and light the city on fire. While Zizka's forces battled the blazes, Sigismund and his armies fled. Zizka caught up with them and he beat them and destroyed them while they fled to Niemetsky Broad. The surviving royalists arrived at the German-controlled city on an unusually cold day, even for January in Central Europe. They had one prevailing order, hold off Zizka's forces long enough for the emperor to escape. In this they were successful, but it was expensive. Germans and Hungarians fought until nightfall, before they were overwhelmed and fled across the river to the city. But unlike this modern structure, the old bridge was narrow, with a gate on either end. As rout turned to panic, 
there was no choice but to run across the frozen river. And many drowned when they crossed the river with their horses and the ice broke under them. And Zhizhka captured all their wagons with rich booty. In the morning, 548 knights and their horses were pulled from the river. The walls of the city were solid, and those who had survived the campaign remained inside, safe for the moment from Zhizhka's wrath. Heavy guns were brought in, and the siege began. Zhishka was a stern enemy, but he was also a man of his word. Emissaries were sent, and negotiations began for a peaceful surrender. But outside the city, some Hussite soldiers found an opening and stormed through the walls. Fighting house to house, it wasn't long before the city was taken and more than a thousand Germans and Hungarians lay dead in the streets. The city was demolished, sacked, and left empty. Wolves and dogs ate the corpses on the town square. Niemetsky Brod was an extraordinary victory for the Hussites, yet a personal tragedy for Zhishka. For the first time, he had lost control of his forces. We, however, did not receive God's help with due gratitude, nor did we at that place give due praise to his gracious favor. Instead, we indulged in greed, pillage, haughty wantonness, and betrayal. And thus we made our Lord God angry. The blind commander felt personally responsible and joined his men in doing penance. The ultimate result, however, was another innovation that changed the way wars have been fought ever since. Today, there's hardly an army in the world without a military code of conduct. Almost all of them can be traced, at least indirectly, to this document created by Zhishka and his closest advisors in the aftermath of the slaughter at Nimetsky Brod. The ideology is there. The Hussite religious ideas are embedded in this document. Uh, how we should fight, why we should fight, what we must not do, and what's going to happen to you if you violate this, because it is the law of God. The military rules of conduct can explain one of the advantages of Zhishka's troops, which was a strong, strict discipline. The rules dealt with all kinds of offenses. On the one hand, they promised severe punishment for those offenses, but on the other hand, the rules constituted a coherent bond within Zhishka's units. But if someone takes anything for himself, and keeps it, and is convicted of this by good testimony, such a one, whoever he be, without exception, shall they punish by the loss of his head. Be he a prince, lord, knight, or squire, townsman, craftsman, or peasant. Similar violations carried similar penalties, and the repeated admonition that the rules apply to everyone equally. For the first time, nobility was subject to the same legal standard as the commoner. The command structure of a medieval army involved large numbers of difficult-to-command military aristocrats, noblemen who were in charge of one or more squadrons of followers. Loyalty tended to be upwards only to one's immediate commander, who was most likely to be one's feudal lord as well. Large-scale tactical command, or any, any approach to what we would call strategic command, was extremely difficult. To insist on the Lord's subordination to a person who may be from a lower class was a break in the centuries-old feudal order. It also meant that commanders could be chosen based upon their skills, not merely the family into which they were born. And Zhishka, as the military commander, was at the top of the hierarchy. It was an unheard of change. Some would say it defied God's will, but to Zhishka, it was the only way to maintain discipline within his forces. Some historians believe this document may have significantly contributed to the end of feudalism and the rise of democracy. But whatever the long-term effect, the short-term result was more bloodshed. Nobles in the city of Prague determined that Zhishka had finally gone too far. This was no longer about faith, it was about defending their rights as nobility. Hussites in Prague joined with royalist forces in a desperate effort to crush Zhishka and reassert their authority. There were a number of skirmishes and chases over the next few months, leading to a hill beside the Laba River near the village of Kostelets. 
Zhishka barely had time to get the wagons into position before his forces were totally surrounded with only a deep section of river behind them. It had been a phenomenal career, but this time there was simply no possibility of escape. The attacking army deliberately camped away from Zhishka's forces so that they could not be fired upon as Sigismund had been at Kutna Hora. The lords at Sigismund's court made bets that Zhishka would not get away this time. The king, who knew Zhishka very well and feared him, bet a horse that the lords would be wrong, that Zhishka would eventually escape them. After several days of siege, the attacking forces prepared to launch the final assault the following morning. When the sun rose, Zhishka's camp was empty. Several thousand soldiers and 300 wagons had simply disappeared into the night. And so the king could keep his horse. No one knows exactly what happened that night. At the time, more than a few people suspected sorcery. Three days later, royalist and Prague forces again approached Zhishka, this time at the village of Malashov. Zhishka was retreating from the enemy. And with the help of his co-captain, Jan Hvězda, he managed to choose terrain to his advantage. Zhishka was excellent at taking advantage of the terrain. Zhishka selected a wide hill above a section of road as it crossed a small river. The soldiers stationed themselves atop the hill and waited. The enemy forces had no choice but to form into narrow, slow-moving columns as they crossed the river. When the enemy was about halfway across, Zhishka began the attack. First, there was the artillery fire, which would cause many soldiers to run for cover. Then Zhishka's infantry began a slow march down the mountain. After a few minutes, several wagons, now filled with rocks, were released and allowed to roll careening down the hill. The wagons passed the Hussite infantry and rolled directly into the enemy lines. Formations broke and crowds of men were swept to one side or the other. It was extraordinary timing, because just as the enemy was in total chaos, Zhishka's infantry arrived and attacked a weakened and broken line. And because of that battle, there were many widows and orphans in Prague and elsewhere in the land. The opposition was destroyed, and soon there was peace again within the Hussite community. The following fall, an expedition was launched to liberate the oppressed Hussite population in the neighboring country of Moravia. The mission was a success, but for the first time, Zhishka lost a battle. There was probably blood poisoning, an infection from some earlier wound, others suspected plague or even assassination. Perhaps it was just age and exhaustion finally catching up with one of the toughest men alive. But whatever the reason, as Zhishka's soldiers were crossing this field in early October, the old warrior finally fell sick and died. This simple monument marks the approximate site where time and disease accomplished what the Pope, the Emperor, and more than 100,000 soldiers never could. He expired the detestable, cruel, horrible, and savage monster, whom no mortal hand could destroy, the finger of God extinguished. When asked in his illness where, after his death, he wanted to be buried, he commanded that his body be flayed, the flesh thrown to the birds and the beasts, and a drum made from his skin. Pope Pius II. There's a myth that on his deathbed, Zizka ordered his men that once he died, they should flay the skin from his body, and out of that skin fashion a drum and the drum was to be carried into battle before the armies. For the Hussites, Zizka was always with them. His spirit, his energy, his genius was still there. To the Crusaders, this demon was still alive in a way that struck fear into their hearts. There was no drum. Zizka was buried with honors in the church of Saints Peter and Paul in Chaslov. The wars continued on and off for another 13 years before the church, the emperor, and the Hussite clergy agreed to a compromise, allowing the Czechs to practice their own faith 
in a realm technically outside the Holy Roman Empire. As part of the agreement, Sigismund, at the age of 68, was finally permitted to rule as king of Bohemia. A year later, he died. Two hundred years later, there was another religious war with very different results. The Hussite leadership was executed, and the area became loyal to the Catholic Church once more. Zizka's tomb was destroyed, and his remains were ordered buried beneath a gallows. But the faith was too firmly planted. Many of the descendants of the Hussites went underground, holding secret services. Others emigrated to America and other nations, seeking religious freedom. In Pennsylvania, one group founded the city of Bethlehem, named for the Bethlehem Chapel, where Hus preached so many years ago. Today, the Catholic Church has accepted the original demands that separated the faiths. Sermons and the Bible are in the local language, communion is given in both kinds, and priests are expected to live exemplary lives of chastity and obedience. The re-established Hussite Church is one of the larger denominations in the modern Czech Republic. Our members see the challenge of Jan Hus as a challenge to live in truth and to create a loving Christian community. In that same country, Zizka is both revered and despised. His skills as a leader and his tactical innovations cannot be denied, but many ask if the violence of the Hussite wars was ever really justified. Jan Zizka asked the same question and answered, when the church or the nation is attacked, we must defend ourselves. I think it is important to defend ourselves if we are attacked, but we should also be capable of reconciliation and forgiveness. War is an exceptional, extraordinary state, but what we want and what we must do is live in peace, which is the normal, the ordinary state, and can be reached only by reconciliation and forgiveness. Almost 500 years after Zizka's death, the Church of Saints Peter and Paul in Shaslav underwent a major reconstruction. Many hoped that some trace of the warrior's tomb could be found, but there was none. The last room to be restored was this small chapel, which had served as a warehouse during construction. Here, as in other parts of the church, there was no sign of a monument. However, as he repaired the plaster beneath this window, a worker discovered what looked like a tombstone with the inscription obliterated. Behind the plaque was a note written in Latin, saying that Zizka's bones were hidden in the opposite wall. It caused an uproar, and after much careful digging and exploration, a walled-over space was discovered, and inside were several bones, most noticeably a skull. Scientists and historians are cautiously excited. This was a rather small man, and not particularly handsome. Yet it was the first direct link to the life of this phenomenal individual. Of course, there is no conclusive proof that this is the skull of Jan Zizka. It could always be some other 65-year-old one-eyed man who survived being shot through his remaining eye almost 600 years ago.